thank you very much. I am very happy to be in Berlin this whole week uh, for this wonderful workshop. I cannot understand why uh, Christiane Koch said that uh, she thought it was not a good idea to organize it, because obviously it is a fantastic idea. And it's great to see really the whole community uh, um, here. And I should uh, thank her for the invitation and, and Marcus as well. Uh, and also for her sort of uh, um, stimulus that she gave me. Because um, last year at the Gordon Conference, she told me after I gave my talk, she said that she was disappointed um, because I really didn't uh, put much effort in preparing my talk. And, uh, um, you know, it's kind of fine if someone tells you and something and they are not right. But it is very bad if they are right. And uh, um, especially if uh, the person telling you that is an authority in your field. So I tried to give me myself a little bit of effort because indeed, you know, uh, uh, last year I was kind of recycling stuff. And now I really want to show you um, the new developments that we have in, in, in our group. You can see several posters. So I will refer to the, to the posters while I, I tell the story. And I will structure this by telling the story of how we can, you know, create the different components of a quantum stack. So, of course, a quantum stack for a quantum computer starts with uh, above with algorithms. And below, of course, you have to compile those algorithms into, into gates. And, and then you have to make those gates. And this is where we come, come in with, with the uh, um, quantum optimal control uh, aspect. And then this, of course, connects to hardware. And this is uh, somehow in the lower part of the stack where my research is focused. So <clears throat> we, uh, I am going to tell you a little bit about the latest developments in, in the methods that we are you know, uh, uh, developing in, in our institute. And then, of course, I will de describe how you uh, do the different components of a, a quantum simulator or quantum computer. And this is what uh, uh, ChatGPT4, uh, actually, DAL E3, uh, told me yesterday when I said, please give me a picture of the fastest Schrodinger cat, because I'm going to show you how you can make the fastest Schrodinger cat. Not only that, but I also am going to show you how you can make the fattest Schrodinger cat, which is what DAL E told me yesterday when I I said that, <clears throat> and then, of course, you can extend that more broadly into gate sequences and compilation. So <clears throat> essentially, first, the first part is about methods that we have. And here is what we, we all know you have some game that you want to play and want to avoid, you know, falling into some of these, of these holes. And in the quantum domain, of course, it's more difficult than in the classical one, because it's like playing this game on a tractor trailer launched, uh, you know, through the uh, Berlin forests at uh, 300 kilometers an hour, and you are playing this game with, of course, your, your, your hands in, in boxing gloves, and you are blindfolded because you cannot look inside. So <clears throat> this is somehow the, the, the kind of challenge that we are having when you do quantum optimal control. And moreover, we want to, uh, there are two points of view here. One point of view is we want to get rid of PhD students and replace them with machines. And the other point of view, which is maybe more humane, uh, is we want to give PhD students more interesting stuff to do and uh, free them from some boring stuff. And this is why we want to make these processes automatic. And of course, as you see here, at the moment, we are kind of more or less uh, doing some, uh, some bricolage. Um, but the, the idea is to make it more and more robust and usable. And actually, uh, as Frank uh, was, was mentioning yesterday, we even founded a startup which can sell you some pieces of software and which try to, to do that. So <clears throat> the methods development that we, uh, we do in, in my group uh, have to do with CRAB, the CHOP random basis algorithm, um, which is based essentially on the idea that you update your correction to your, to your pulse shape uh, using some basis functions and uh, um, sort of reduced basis, basis functions, which are partially randomized. And there are different possible examples of those basis functions that you can use. And typically, what happens is, I mean, in most applications that we did in, since the beginning, in the past uh, kind of decade, um, it was mostly based on Fourier basis and mostly based on simplex search, meaning that you go, you uh, reduce the dimensionality of a problem by, by going to some dual space. So, for instance, Fourier space. Uh, and then you have a few parameters, which are amplitude and phases of your, of your components. And then you go down with a, a method which does not require a gradient. It's a simplex search, an elder mid, and then you get a pulse shape, which typically is actually suitable for experimental implementation. And we have some demonstrations how it works. Um, but of course, I mean, this is just one possible approach to that. So the idea of CRAB is just going to some other function space to cut down the basis and to use, you know, the most suited search that there is there. So it means that, for instance, uh, I mean, one, one important point is that we are uh, uh, using the advantage that this works without a gradient. So it can be used in, in closed loop. 
uh, it can be used in, a, in an efficient way also to optimize uh, uh, um, quantum many body systems. I will show examples of that. Um, and then there are next to an elder mid, there are other methods, you know, conju conjugate gradient methods and even, you know, uh, kind of swarm machine learning inspired evolutionary strategies like the CNAES. And what I want to make as a clear statement here is CRUB is not just, you know, simplex search in Fourier space is much further than that. And we are extending that to different possibilities in, in our group. And then <clears throat> one important point here is that you can end up, of course, in a, in a local minimum. And the fact that you are truncating the basis offers you a fantastic opportunity to uh, go out of some, such local minima because the shape of the landscape that you have, uh, you can, I, I will show there is also a poster by, by Martino here. I will refer to that later, how you can learn the, the, the landscape. But the, in essence, the shape of the landscape depends on how you cut your, your search space. And so if you get stuck in a certain realization of the search space, you get stuck in a local minimum, you can, of course, change that uh, uh, by just um, replacing one of your basis functions. This changes the landscape. And then, uh, I mean, all, you are almost sure, mathematically almost sure, that you are going then to, to roll down further because you are no longer in a local minimum. And <clears throat> uh, one important point, and this is one of the new things that we are working on, and this is work with uh, with uh, uh, Phila Rembold and Alice Pagano from Padua, uh, from the group of Simone Montangero, um, is, as I said, Fourier is one possibility, but you can use other possibilities. Uh, of course, I mean, one in the next uh, uh, talk, we are going to see about piecewise uh, constant functions, which is, if you wish, one type of basis in which you get square functions and you, and you optimize. So you can look at that as also from the crab angle, but you want to have more freedom um, than that. And you want also to, uh, I mean, Square functions have artifacts like they have, uh, you know, singularities and, and and many Fourier leakage, let's say, of Fourier components outside of a certain band bandwidth that you want to to achieve, and so you can use other things. So for instance, uh, the sync basis or also the sigmoid basis, which is based on so, sort of smooth error function like steps. And this is what we uh, have done more recently, trying to compare the output of different bases in in this context. And one example is here, what you can see, uh, I mean, it's not like one basis fits all, okay? So it's different problems, even different kinds of processes with the same physical system can have different, uh, uh, different bases which are most suited for the, for, the, for the purpose. And here we compare, so the, the, the um, uh, pale blue is the Fourier, the green is sync, and the sigmoid is the yellow one. You see for a single qubit gate, which is here, to, to the left, you see that it converges much, much faster with the sigmoid basis. And with, instead with a two qubit gate, actually um, uh, uh, it's much better to use the, the sync basis. So it depends, you can test, and this is one additional freedom that you have, if you wish, into your, your, your optimization, because you can use different possibilities. And they are, of course, adapted not only to the nature of your physical system, but also to the process that you, uh, that you are going to, to, to develop. I mean, the next example is giving us a little bit of an insight about that. So here I compare, um, also connecting to the next talk by, by Ilya Kuprov, uh, a piecewise constant uh, um, uh, pulse shape to a sigmoid basis. Um, and here you see that the point is, if you have a Q-treat, you want to do a two-qubit gate, what you want to avoid is, you know, leakage occupying the third, the spurious state, which means obviously that there is a certain frequency that you want to avoid, okay, which is the transition frequency between one of your states, state, let's say state one, and uh, your state two, and it means that you want to be able to, uh, to avoid in the spectrum of your control pulse a certain frequency. And you can see here that with the, the sigmoid basis, due to its, uh, I would say, uh, higher smoothness and, uh, and uh, sort of uh, a smaller leakage to, uh, to, to other uh, um, Fourier components, if you wish, or to other frequencies, you can actually select away one of the frequencies, and this is the frequency that you want to, to, to kill out. And I expect that maybe, you know, also Ilya Kuprov, when he's going to go beyond the, the piecewise constant, is maybe going to refer to some, something like this. So this is something that we can also see, and we uh, can embed and incorporate in our uh, um, CRUB. And the <clears throat> useful point is that this, since it is not based on gradient, it works in a, in a, in a feedback loop. Essentially, I try a test pulse, I give it to, to some experiment, and then I measure the figure of merit, and then I upgrade, uh, update and upgrade the performance. And this goes also as a cloud service, if you wish, in the sense that you can install you know, your, uh, our little client in your lab, which you know, interacts with your experiment. And then over the internet, you can get 
the um, uh, improvement for for your um, your pulse shape. And I will show some examples where this happens. This is the first example which we try to implement actually across the hallway. We were in Ulm at the time. It was now now seven years ago. And the point is, you want the student to go to sleep sometimes. Okay, sometimes you want to allow your students to 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 go to sleep, and so you start at midnight, as you can see here, uh, zero time, with a fidelity which is fifty percent for a certain um, uh, uh, gate transformation for a, for an MB center. In this in this case, this is a single qubit transformation. You start with a with a square pulse. It doesn't work very well, and then you switch on this uh, uh, closed loop. And tomorrow morning, as, as you can see, at eight, the student comes. They have done nothing. The machine have, has optimized for them to 100% within the experimental error. So this was the first demonstration that this actually can work. And what we want to do is to make it more systematic. So please visit. And now I don't know because some of these posters will have to be unmounted because Michael Gertz is going to take over the whole building. And so some of these posters are going to disappear. So please be sure to visit if you're interested and you have not done that. The posters with, uh, before the, the lunch break and uh, the poster by Thomas Reiser, who is uh, sitting uh, somewhere here. I saw him before. Yes, here. Uh, <clears throat> is showing our quantum optimal control suite, so which uh, we publish in computer physics communications. There is a GitHub repository on that. And uh, it is especially suited for connection for uh, with uh, um, uh, QD. So we have applied it very much in uh, um, uh, Diamond and the centers type of uh, um, systems. And they have also their own software suite with which we are, we are interfacing, which enables to you know, process in a, in a closed loop uh, exactly what I described before. And the poster by, by, by Thomas is about um, you know, different gate set evaluation metrics which you can use in order to, to compare and to benchmark the performance of, of your, your algorithm. So this is currently, again, exploring the space, not only of basis, not only of, of search uh, possibilities, but also of you know, methods to evaluate your, your uh, figure of merit. Now, we start, so this is about the methodology that we are developing. I will come back a little bit afterwards to, to some aspects of machine learning that we are uh, implementing now. And now I want to go a little bit into the, uh, the different components of what you want to have to realize in the lab in order to make a, in this case, neutral atom-based quantum computer. There is also here some complementarity, of course, uh, uh, as Frank has shown in his institute in, in Ulich, they are working mostly on solid state qubits. We also have some work on solid state, but we focus mostly on uh, AMO systems, which here were which is where the, the first applications on, of this came from in my, in my sort of own uh, path. And one first example of uh, a process which we can optimize over the cloud is cooling of the, of the atoms. When you want to, to make a register with the atoms in an optical lattice, you need, of course, to, to have a Bose-Einstein condensator to do that. And here we used uh, an interface which was uh, created by Jakob Scherson in Orhus for gamifying quantum experiments. So what they did was they, uh, they did this citizen scientist uh, experiment in which uh, you know, they put together a certain experiment you know, with, with a um, uh, um, magneto-optical trap, which they were then modulating in, in terms of depth and, and, and frequency in order to create a Bose-Einstein condensate. And then people, really real people, could connect to this and play with the pulse shapes that uh, they would regulate how this, uh, this uh, uh, laser field intensity is, uh, is evolving with time, and they will get a score corresponding to the number of atoms which get in the condensate. You know, what we tried to do was to compete against people. It's actually quite remarkable. One of the results that they had in, this, in, in their work was that actually humans can actually, using natural intelligence, compete very smartly with, with machines. Of course, you, know, you still expect that machines can outperform people. Interestingly, they do not outperform people by, by much, so by, let's say, maybe 20%. But at least the important point here was that you know, we could use this uh, sort of remote interface, this remote access, which was set up for this, uh, for this experiment at the time, in order to demonstrate that indeed our method works. And one interesting aspect, which normally I don't show in, in, in sort of general uh, talks, but um, which actually is relevant for the community here, is that there are different, uh, so the landscape topology is such that there are different strategies, so uh, which are, you know, you could uh, you are playing with the magnetic field, with uh, an RF knife, and also with the laser field's intensity, and you can play in different ways. So there are different families, if you wish, of, of uh, optimizations, which go with uh, you know first you 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 play with uh, 
with the, you you make the magnetic trapping lower and then you you lower the the the, uh, the laser intensity or vice versa or you do it in a combined way and the interesting thing is that you can find also you know bridges between these uh, um, dif different classes of intuitively physically motivated uh, strategies and you can actually interpolate between them and this is something which we would also like to do systematically and uh, this is poster by Martino Calzavara, who is also sitting here, um, which I, I think also will need to be dismantled by, by, by lunchtime. So please uh, make sure not to miss it. And here the idea is that he would like to learn to use somehow the solutions that you, so you have a certain pulse shape, which is developed uh, by, by some quantum optimal control algorithm. You apply it to the system, you get, uh, you know, a certain time evolution, and then you can measure some fidelity, and then you give it to a, a essentially a machine learning classical surrogate system, which is supposed to learn features of the landscape topology in order to uh, make uh, good use of that somehow. Um, this is still work in progress. Uh, so, and Martino will be happy, I guess, to, to tell you details on that. And this is one first example, because as of course, Professor Koch uses to say, actually machine learning is a subfield of optimal control. You know, at least reinforcement learning is a subfield of optimal control. I think this is a very correct statement, yeah? And so, but now we are trying also to, to, to go back and to use, to use some of these machine learning methods in order to help us in our task. So then, once you have your atoms all loaded in your, in your uh, or, or, or cooled down in your, in your uh, low temperature Bose Einstein condensate, you want to load them in a quantum register. So this works typically with a quantum phase transition, which starts with a superfluid, and you have an optical lattice, so a, a laser generated potential, which is very low, and then you, you, you raise it. Uh, there are other talks about uh, these kind of things um, uh, in, 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 this, uh, in this workshop. And our point, again, is you want to end up without defects. So you want to have one atom per lattice site, and you want to do it in a shorter time than the already highly optimized uh, pulse shapes that they have in experiment, because they have been working, you know, uh, 20 years on this kind of, of pulse shapes. They have developed some wonderful adiabatic methods in order to you know, get there to the goal with a very high fidelity, very high uh, number of atoms, one per lattice site. So the, the figure of merit there is the mean occupation in each lattice site. But of course, if you do it adiabatically, this is lasting some significant amount of time. So of the order of 100 milliseconds, and we want to shorten it. So this is kind of the, the pulse shape that we want to uh, apply. And of course, this is a really kind of many body dynamics because it is a many body system which then makes a transition, a coherent transition into the state that you want to reach. And so you could either do it uh, um, with a linear pulse shape, which of course would not be very productive, or you can use CRAB, and this is the blue pulse shape, which is going to give you much better results. So here is what comes out. What we want to have is unit occupation in the middle region of this, uh, of this quantum register, so one atom per lattice site. And if you do it without optimization, you get a defect density around here of, uh, in the center of this uh, uh, um, register, which is about 15%. And instead, if you use optimal control, you can go to the, within the uh, experimental error to the, to the unit occupant. And you can even show that this has a quantum speed limit kind of <coughs> feature because it's universal of quantum speed limit that if you try to shrink the time for a uh, um, certain quantum process, you do not manage at some point, of course, for too short a time, which is beyond the, the typical time scale of your system, you are not, not, not going to be able to reach. So you want to rotate your, your uh, quantum state, your state vector to some goal state, and you cannot get there if you don't have enough time, given a certain set of resources and, and power and, and drive that you have in your system. And so there is a, a typically a, a, a kind of universal cosine square, which is like projection of the state, uh, the, the moving state to the goal state, and square type of uh, behavior of the fidelity as a, as a function of time. And here you see that this is confirmed in this, in this experiment. And actually what we see is that indeed, you know, we can get the, the, the performance at the speed limit in the sense that at the optimal time, we can bring the system down to the noise floor. And so you are sure that you are doing the best that it is possible given a certain set of experimental constraints. And you are also sure that it is not worthwhile trying to, to do it faster. And this is something which, you know, for these kind of systems, it's possible to calculate it analytically for two-level systems, but not for more complex systems. And so this is something which can be an output heuristically, if you wish, of your optimal control strategy, which is very important for experimentalists. Now, you can do this with um, 
uh, bosons or also with fermions. With fermions, you have a collective enhancement of adiabaticity because fermions do not like to sit in the same lattice site, obviously. So also there, if you raise uh, the, the potential, <coughs> you know, it, it goes up. And, uh, uh, and then you end up with one atom per lattice site. This is a, an idea which we had 20 years ago with, together with colleagues in, in Trento. And now I am putting it here because some of the projects that we are doing uh, and some of the posters that, that are presented, uh, in particular the posters of Juhi, uh, I think uh, is also connecting to, to that kind of, 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 of thing. And also of, of Christina, we'll come back to that in a moment. So, <clears throat> okay, now you have your atoms, one per lattice site, and then you want to create the fastest Schrodinger cat, which is possible with those resources. How do you do that? Well, uh, one, one way to do that is to create a state-dependent potential, which uh, displaces your atoms depending on internal state. So here is um, a diagram from the uh, group of Andrea Alberti uh, and Dieter Meshed in Bonn, which uh, have done the experiment, and they can achieve really some exquisite state-dependent control of the system in the sense that they will be able to create a superposition. So uh, one atom in a certain state will stay in, in, in one site and the other one can be moved, and they can do it really very precisely. So typically you have problems when you create a quantum optimal control pass that the experiment cannot really follow it properly. But in this case, they really can do exactly what you want, which enables them to <coughs> reach, indeed, the quantum speed limit. So here is a picture of the fidelity, like it's for transport. So it's ground state to ground state fidelity. You want to transport an atom from here to there, you know, in the shortest possible time. If you do it with a simple ramp, you have, of course, sloshing motion, which you excite not vertically. So for some times, you manage to catch back the atom in, uh, in, the, in the ground state at the end. But of course, this is degrading as you uh, uh, lower the time. And instead, if you optimize, you can show experimentally that you get down to the smallest possible time, you get to essentially unit fidelity. This is for transport of one atom from one uh, place to another. And then, of course, since it is state dependent, you can use it also to generate a Schrodinger cat, which is superposition of atom in state down here, uh, um, right, and a plus atom in state up here, left. And then you can measure the coherence by doing a, an interference experiment. And you can try to do this to measure the visibility of those interference fringes, lowering the time. And then also there, you can reach the speed limit. So this is the, given those resources that you have, it is the fastest way in which you can generate a Schrodinger cat of this kind. And again, you get a contrast dependence, which has the, uh, shows the typical scaling, which uh, tells you that indeed at about 1.5 uh, harmonic oscillator times, harmonic oscillator periods, you are at the speed limit. And of course, this is much shorter than adiabatic because doing this transport adiabatically would be something which takes orders of magnitude longer than the, uh, the typical time scale of the system, which is the harmonic oscillator uh, oscillation frequency. Okay, so, well, now what Christina is working on is doing this um, actual implementation of a quantum computer with fermionic atoms, actually. Uh, so this is uh, uh, something which is being experimentally verified in the group of Christian Gross in Tübingen. And uh, I don't know in which room uh, uh, Christina's poster is, but in case you have not yet seen it, you, you will be able to see how you can play games essentially in the same way to really use optical tweezers in this optical lattice in order to really create an, an architecture which we are uh, you know, working on as a demonstrative project for quantum computer here in, uh, uh, funded by the German government. Now you have your atoms. Your qubits, they are, you know, all uh, well, well placed and you want to move them. Now you want to entangle them. And there are different aspects of entangling them. The first aspect, which is in the poster of, of Juhi, is Juhi Singh, which also uh, I think is somewhere here. Yes, over there. Uh, <coughs> so she is working on how to do two qubit gates with those fermions. So <coughs> the point is you want to have, you have two fermions, you want to lower uh, the barrier in this, uh, in this uh, um, super lattice in such a way that there is some exchange uh, interaction, and then you want them to end up in, a, in the swapped state. So if they are in the, in the same state, they will stay where they are, and if they're in different states, they will exchange place. And of course, you can achieve that. You can do the calculation with a, uh, with a you know, uh, in, the, in this Hubbard model, because this is a little super lattice with many of these ions around, and you can do this by using the two lowest bands, the two lowest states, and then you can get you know, good fidelity, as no one will be surprised to see. So here are the pulse shapes. But then the point is, if you take into account actually the fact that there are other, there is leakage you know, to other bands, 
then you see that your fidelity goes down. But then when you use that, you can use this leakage actively because this is, as we know, a you know, feature of optimal control. You can use coherence. And here it is many body coherence because this is many body, many body states uh, that you use. So you can go to higher bands and you are able in this way to achieve a gate, which is instead of 30, uh, 0 0.30 uh, milliseconds, 0 0.10, 0 0.1 milliseconds. So you, you even can exploit the leakage if you do it actively in order to get to a, a, a shorter um, gate duration. And again, this is something which we are testing in, in this project ThermiQP in the lab of uh, Christian Gross in Tübingen. Well, there are <clears throat> other ways, more general ways, to uh, suppress uh, uh, leakage. So here's the poster, I guess, by, by Boshi, I think, yes. So uh, which uh, this one, I am sure that it is in the, in the forbidden room, so make sure to go there during the coffee break, uh, unless you have done that already. And the point is, that here, I mean, here is for a different uh, um, implementation. Of course, in Ulic, we work a lot on with solid state qubits. So this is implementation which was, was done uh, under supervision of, so, of, of Felix Mozoi, who is uh, you know, a, a student from, from Frank's group in superconducting qubits. And the idea here is we want to do a, um, a quantum gate in a superconducting qubit, but we have a lot of leakage channels because there are other levels and there are different possibilities. And each of these possibilities, each of these errors, single photon, two photon, three photon, can be cured one by one, essentially, by <coughs> using this new approach, which has been developed by, uh, in our group. Uh, essentially, it's worked by, by Boshi. Uh, <coughs> and this is uh, the idea of making a, a transformation, which enables you to you know, uh, go to an adiabatic frame. Then you have some residual terms, and you cancel them with a, an especially suited drug pulse, which in many cases you can even calculate analytically. And you go error by error, so you take care of one error after the other, and you can see that you uh, reduce the, uh, the, the fidelity. Of course, there is always a certain uh, speed limit here, because, I mean, you cannot do uh, gates shorter than, than, than a certain a given you know, limit, but you can see, also see that, of course, eliminating those errors uh, enables you to get closer to that speed limit. Very good. <coughs> so, well, also what we want to do is we want to uh, use, again, the reinforcement learning to entangle qubits in other platforms. Okay. So, for instance, here it's for, with semiconductor qubits. This is a poster by Mohammed Abidi, uh, in which he is essentially using uh, um, a neural network in order to optimize some, uh, um, some gate operation with spin qubits in, uh, in, uh, in quantum dots. Um, and <clears throat> I mean, if you wish, nothing new in a sense, because this is, this is uh, uh, something that you expect should work. But there is indeed something new, which is that, you know, this is uh, in a way uh, more model free than, than, than other implementations that we have discussed. And also it enables you to reach a, a bigger robustness, which uh, he shows in his poster about uh, the, the sort of resilience of your, of your algorithm with respect to, to external disturbances. So. OK. Uh, <clears throat> and now, I mean, this was about entangling pairs of, uh, of qubits. Now we also want to go, as I promised, towards the fattest Schrodinger cat. So this is something which uh, uh, made my colleague Renner Blatt very angry, because he had a very fat Schrodinger cat. And then we came with a fatter one. And then he got so angry that he made an even fatter one. OK, but ours, I mean, I think I, I think was, was the, the world's fattest for uh, one and a half years, which is enough if you're competing with, with such uh, bright people. And to do that, we used uh, uh, a system by, by uh, Michel Looking. Um, it is the same system with which they have demonstrated, uh, actually, last December, you know, 48 logical qubits. So they have excellent capability of manipulating those readable atoms in optical tweezers. And the point here was not to do a quantum computer, but to create a many body state. So we wanted a GZ state. And <clears throat> essentially, in this system, if you drive the detuning of the uh, transition with which you, you, you sort of are exciting these, these atoms, what as a function of the detuning, you can move from uh, a state with all atoms in the ground state to a superposition of down, up, down, up, down, up, plus, up, down, up, down, up, down, which is indeed a Schrodinger cat. And the point is, well, this guy has two components, two branches of the wave function, uh, and you can measure the population, which you achieve with our, uh, again, our um, red crab 
um, algorithm. Um, and well, okay, but then you also want to measure coherence to be sure that you know those those two branches are in a coherent superposition. So you can do that with a, a parity measurement. And of course, you want the fidelity of this parity measurement to be uh, at least fifty percent, because here the point was not to make a very high fidelity quantum computer, but to see how much we can get, how much how big we can get the the system in terms of of entanglement. And so we can do that up to twenty. Uh, atoms, so which was the largest number uh, at the time. Of course, you can see that as you increase the number of atoms, of course, the frequency of these uh, parity oscillations is increasing, but also the visibility is decreasing because, of course, I mean, those are Rydberg atoms and uh, there is uh, also collective uh, decay channels. So, you know, the coherence is around the corner. The important part is this graph here, which, uh, which shows that essentially what you have is if you do the... <coughs> uh, um, uh, Simulation, you ju just do things theoretically, okay? And then you do them without optimization for 20 qubits, you are not able to reach uh, the, this fidelity 50%, which tells you that you do have a JT state. With the uh, um, simulation, which is optimized, taking into account uh, the, the you know imperfections in the physical system, you do get above that. And of course, there is some degradation due to experimental imperfections, which we do not take care of, which now with the new methods, including those developed by Boshi, we could be able also to, to deal with. By, by the way, I forgot to mention that Boshi, with this method of uh, multi-derivative removal of, of errors, managed to get on an IBM machine um, the, the, the highest possible fidelity, which can you can get from a, from a, a fixed coupling multi-qubit uh, chip, which is accessible online. And so we are optimistic that applying that here, we would get further improvement. And the point is that even without that, we, as you can see, with 20 atoms, you can still have a fidelity above that limit. And the also very relevant point for us as a control community is that indeed the excitations is not just, you are not just going almost diabetic and close to this a diabetic speed limit, but you are really going, you are exciting and de exciting in the sense that you see here as you increase the number of atoms. The population in the uh, uh, um, ground state is going down during the uh, the um, the you know gate operation the, during the entangling operation, and the population in uh, leakage, if you wish, in the, in higher states and excited states, is actually increasing with the number of atoms, which shows that you need more coherence in the higher states in order to reach that goal. Uh, <clears throat> very good. And actually, one other important nice uh, feature of this is that. Um, the, the year after doing this experiment, I met uh, Professor Looking at a conference, and uh, he presented a, a, a paper that was realized using our red crab algorithm. Uh, but I was not aware of that paper. And so I asked, oh, wonderful, so, but, but what about that? And he said, oh, oh, sorry, oh, I should have told you. Actually, we had this remote access to your, to your server, and I'm actually logged in, and we used it, uh, and we did this other experiment. I hope you don't mind. And actually, not only... I did not mind, but I was very happy because this was exactly the uh, goal that we have to make sure that what we develop can be used in experiments without really without any intervention and without us even knowing what, what, what it is about. So this showed that indeed the system is practical. And in fact, we are together with Frank and Simone Montangelo in Padua, we are commercializing that with, with our leader startup. Uh, but this is a, I, I don't have any advertisement slide on our startup. I will not even say the name because this is a scientific conference. And what I want to do instead is to go to a next uh, uh, step. So now we have done all the building blocks, okay, <clears throat> of our um, of our quantum computer. But now we want to go a little bit higher in the stack. So we want to <clears throat> start working towards compilation. And there is even a poster by Robert Sire uh, <clears throat> about, you know, looking into, into algorithms. So towards compilation, <clears throat> what does it mean? Well, here is a work that we did um, uh, um, with, uh, with Francesco Preti. He is not here today, a PhD student, and, and Felix Mozzoi, about <clears throat> quantum gate synthesis. So the point is, you know, depth is a problem in quantum circuits. You want to have your, your unitary operation in the smallest, not only, you know, with the highest possible uh, um, fidelity in the individual building blocks, which is what I showed before, but you also want to have, you know, altogether the smallest possible number of gates so that you can get to your result with the minimum possible degradation of the fidelity. And so if you just take a discrete gate set, you know, like we know that uh, the, there is universality, so you can get a two qubit gate and uh, a subset of single qubit gates, Clifford gates, and so on, and you can combine them and you can get any 
uh, quantum circuit, but this may require many gates. Instead, you may be able to reduce the depth if you go to a continuous gate set. So you have a few kinds of gates, two single, two and three qubit gates, which depend on some parameters. If you can synthesize them and identify them in such a way that you can, you know, <clears throat> really make, a, a, uh, uh, make with a shorter number, with a smaller number of those gates, then you can get to a, a more complex quantum algorithm. So we want to <coughs> synthesize such families of gates. And here is where we use neural networks with this new method for uh, um, which we call SOMA, single optimization, multiple application. Why? <coughs> In the sense that, you know, we do, uh, we learn somehow the whole landscape and then we can apply the gates that we learned not just one by one in a fixed way, but in a parameterized way. And we are sure that they are going to be optimal uh, within, to a certain extent within a broad range of, of parameters. So <clears throat> this can work both in a supervised learning fashion in the sense that you take uh, several instances of an of a, um, optimal control problem and you optimize each one of them. And then you give the solutions to a neural network which learns you know, <clears throat> what to do outside of this uh, parameter space. Okay, and then <clears throat> you get Essentially, you get you train your network, and this is supervised learning with data produced by by optimization, and then you you <coughs> you you try to get a, a more a broader recipe of what you should be doing, or you can use that directly without optimizing each one of these guys with optimal control. You can use backpropagation, which is a feature of neural networks as well as of gradient-based approaches. Yes, so it's it's in common. So somehow there is, and again, Professor Koch is right in saying that machine learning is a is a branch of what we are doing here. And so you are, uh, uh, you know, embodying that in this new kind of algorithm, which directly takes uh, your problem, you know, modeled and learns how to uh, minimize fidelity overall. Okay, not just based on specific instances. And then you can apply this to different uh, uh, kinds of uh, scenarios. For instance, a QPU, uh, um, a solid state quantum computer, which has different qubits with different uh, uh, couplings. And in many cases, these couplings are intentionally different over a broad range to avoid crosstalk. For instance, in IBM machines, this is the case. And so you want to be able to apply your gates in an efficient way, you know, regardless of what is the specific value of the, of the parameter. Or you can also use this in cases in which you have drift. So you, you, over a certain number of days, you have your parameter values which are sort of <coughs> changing and drifting away. And you want to recalibrate that. So you can use this high robustness of this method in, in the, for, for doing that, here is just one example in which the unsupervised learning really beats all other, including robust methods for um, optimal control for a certain, this is a very simple uh, um, single qubit gate, but it shows that really you can get several orders of magnitude improvement by using this kind of machine learning approaches. And <clears throat> now the last point I want to make is a, a, a poster by Robert Sire. Uh, which is his own, I'm not involved in this, in this work, so uh, uh, it's his own research together with other collaborators. And <clears throat> he is going up in the stack because there are algorithms such as uh, quantum uh, uh, approximate optimization algorithm, Huawa, which essentially, again, are instances of optimal control because it has to do with optimization. You find you know, optimal parameters in order to do your, your, your whole algorithm as opposed to individual chunks of it. So you are sort of enlarging the scope of what you're optimizing. And then, you know, uh, uh, there are some sort of mixed feelings here in the sense that, uh, that it turns out that somehow the barren plateaus which uh, turn up in this optimization should, uh, you know, in, uh, in Robert's opinion, <coughs> uh, uh, lead us to reconsider, you know, somehow the, the, the general validity, which is, uh, you know, uh, very much uh, um, talked about in, in propaganda by many companies. Uh, also, and we should be more careful about this. And Robert is going to be able to, to give you details if you do that before the coffee break, because afterwards he will be dismantled. And so with this, uh, since it's 40 minutes after the beginning of the talk, I am telling you the summary that essentially <clears throat> we are working hard to expand our control library, to apply it to many different physical systems, many different scenarios, expanding robustness, and using all that we can uh, grab. <clears throat> so what uh, I did, I, I started my, my career with was, you know, going to uh, <coughs> Professor Kozlov and, and his colleagues been fascinated by these wonderful things he was preaching by taking in all this new truth and porting it to, to quantum technologies. Uh, <coughs> and uh, this came from the 
say, physical chemistry and chemical physics community. I never understood the difference between physical chemistry and chemical physics. Someone can explain that to me. But those ideas <coughs> were really uh, crucial for us. And now we want to steal some other ideas, of course, from machine learning. This is <coughs> what is coming up next. And we can integrate them very much because, after all, you know, machine learning and artificial intelligence is just a sub-branch of optimal control. And so we can use it at all levels in, <coughs> in the quantum stack. And with this, I thank you, and I am finished with my presentation. <laughs> thank you very much. So usually we advise the PhD students to not to talk too fast, but I guess in your case, this is a trademark. So I'm sure there are many questions. Jens, it's a long way. But we have people uh, online, so. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks for the wonderful talk also. I appreciate that uh, optim uh, machine learning is a part of optimal control. That's great to hear. Um, on the on the gate synthesis problem, I mean that's an interesting approach that you do. Um, have you also tried to use like reinforcement learning ideas for a similar task? Because that seems like quite suitable for like gate synthesis for given unitary to optimize the circuit layout. Wow. Well. Uh... In essence, uh, all the rest of what we do is reinforcement learning, if you wish, in mm -hmm. the sense that you have a, a, a clear sort of uh, uh, um, fig the figure of merit is your <clears throat> the thing that you give back to your your machine to uh, to, to to as as a, as a reward. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, we we have been uh, <clears throat> trying to do that, but actually it is less effective. So it is very effective, as we know, for uh, you know the building blocks. Mm -hmm. But when you start going up in, ah, in complexity, mm -hmm. uh, it uh, has uh, some limitations. And these uh, approaches seem to be, I mean, these are first indications because we have not done a fully systematic study, but it seems to be more uh, uh, sort of uh, productive, more promising, this kind of. OK, that, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's right. I mean, it scales completely abysmally in the system side. Yeah. Can I okay. ask a quick second question? Um, the, the, the Squawa approach is also interesting. Um, like using control, and I was hoping to see more optimal control approaches to quantum approximate optimization. Um, like the, but of course, the, 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 the controlling is, is one part of the, the matter. The other part is to be expressive enough to do something with it, right? And there's kind of um, an interplay between control and quantum approximate optimization, then expressivity, like having suitably con complex circuits in the first place, and classical similarity ability. So is there any hope to use like optimal control also in exploring this interplay of expressivity and controllability? Because there's many things I can easily control, which are just stupid short circuits, which are great to control, but they are not very useful in any application because they're just not expressive. So is there some fresh insight one gets from optimal control in expressivity and not only controllability? I would say that there is hope, yes, for sure. And the fresh insight, I wouldn't say that. We, as, as you see, we are trying. We are starting to climb up the up the stack, and this is one of the next things on the on the to do list. I think also in general, let's say for uh, as a community, uh, and of course you are on one of the leaders there, and actually one of the work packages that we put into some of the projects in, the, in which we are together with BMBF also would like to build that connection. But honestly, I cannot say that we have any fresh results on that. But uh, this is certainly on the to do list, and we would be excited to to interact on that. It's good to see that you still know how to give good scientific talks. Um, about the sigmoid basis or the comparison of the different bases, I, I thought this, this would be interesting. Do you have any insight on why um, one choice of bases performs better? Like for the single qubit gates, the sigmoids won, and for the two qubit gate, the, the sync won. So did you look at the solutions? What kind of drives uh, were these? And why was one basis better adapted than the other? Well, we actually looked at the solution, but uh, we didn't, uh, we, were, we would like, I mean, this I mean, would be the whole point. <laughs> we can get an insight on that. But actually, we were not able to, to, to find any, any clear insight. The physical insight, uh, you know, uh, comparing to piecewise, was that what I said before, that you can select some frequencies away, and that, uh, you know, uh, enables you to, to avoid leakage in this, uh, in this simple case. But um, you know, in the, in the two qubit gate, why, why it is a, a reverse, I wouldn't be able to say. But maybe Ilya can. The optimal basis to second order is the one that diagonalizes the Hessian. 
because it decouples the degrees of freedom uh, in your optimization problem. Yes, okay, but why would uh, in, in a single qubit uh, uh, case one and why the other? Okay, so even Professor Kuprov does not know. So, I mean, how am I supposed to know? Yeah. <laughs> so, I, thanks for your talk. I was wondering, following up on Christian's, you see your basis is global. This works. Oh, well, because the, a global basis uh, takes uh, better, like, things Fourier, things uh, frequency. It can uh, take better into account the physical properties of the system, such as the response to certain frequency, the spectrum of the system. It's even, it's even a way to do tomography evaluation indirectly. Okay. So, I mean, uh, a, a given system, a, a multi-level system, we have some frequencies which... Uh, which you know are relevant for you, some frequencies which you want to avoid. So working in the in the in the frequency basis, you know, allows you to sort of select and to uh, you know go towards the ones which are relevant for you. And we have two uh, aspects in our algorithm which take care of that. One is the randomization of crowd R, the randomization that you always you shake it a little bit, okay. And the other one is in D crab. So the, the uh, landscape engineering, which allows you to say, okay, this frequency is not working. Let me get rid of it. Let me try another one. Okay. And so and this is global, and it does speak more directly to the physics of the system in many cases. 